this is the one, this is for the last um, section of our conference. The one, the, the one that should go up, it's called Welcome in Address. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. This Thank one. You. Yes, correct. Thanks. Got it. Okay. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay. And we are live. This is for the last. Um...
Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Networks Mapping Labor in Theater and Performance, DTSA Graduate Center, a uh, Graduate Student Conference 2020, uh, presented by to you by the PhD program in Theater and Performance at the Graduate Center City University of New York. Uh, my name is Rachel Dong, and I'm a PhD student in the program. Uh, on behalf of the com conference organizing committee, uh, Taylor Calbert, uh, Mayura Kashi Sen, Alex Vittoria Arturo, and myself, I want to first thank Professor Shannon Jackson, Professor David Severin, and all the presenters and moderators for kindly joining us to make this conference possible. We are extremely grateful for the tremendous work you have done, and we are all excited to hear the work that you are going to share with us today. Uh, we also want to thank the Cohen Fund, the Roberts Fund, the Lotel Fund, the Executive Officers Fund, the Martin E. Siegel Center, the DTSA, and the Doctoral Students Council for the support for this endeavor. We also want to thank HowlRound especially Vijay Matthew and Sia Rogers for your help, patience, and warmth over the past months. It would be impossible to put together such an unusual conference without all your generous support. And again, we thank all of you with our full hearts. Um, next, we want to thank all the audience for tuning in today from your living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, or hallways. It means a lot to us and gives us a purpose here during this difficult time. Uh, we invite you to join our live Q&A session after each panel and the keynote speech. And you can participate um, in three ways. First, you can post your questions as comments underneath our Facebook live streaming. Second, uh, you can tweet your questions at HowlRound's official Twitter and use the hashtag networks2020 so we can track your questions. Third, you can private message us on our official Instagram, and you can find us at PhD Theater Grad Center CUNY. And in light of this current crisis, our conference organizing committee um, redistributed part of our, of our budget towards donations. If you are able, we encourage you to do the same. Um, there is a link, <coughs> sorry. There is a link on our HowlRound page where you can find a non exhaustive list of organizations working for people in need and other resources for artists who are struggling. Thank you so much. Next, please welcome Professor David Severin, distinguished professor at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Let me welcome you all to a conference that has become utterly different from the face-to-face -face encounter originally planned. Living in unprecedented times, we face unprecedented challenges in almost every aspect of our lives. And rather than postpone, a conference whose subject has become increasingly urgent, the planning committee has wisely decided to move it online. So, how do we analyze and theorize the negotiation between seen and unseen labor at a time when these relations have been wholly transformed? How do we talk about offstage labor when theaters everywhere are shuttered and onstage labor has been disappeared? When the relation between the visible and the invisible is constantly being reworked? When performing artists are among those most devastatingly impacted by the drying up of employment, and termination of contracts, when live performance becomes screen performance, when cams and mics are indispensable props, when pre-recorded videos are a connection to a once real world. Must we from now on use the past tense 
in talking about the theater. I want to express my deepest gratitude to the graduate students who have dedicated themselves to making this conference happen. My thanks to all the other participants for sharing your labor, and especially to keynote speaker Shannon Jackson, whose scholarship has been so tirelessly dedicated to the analysis of the work of art of knowledge production, of pedagogy, and of social practice. Before relinquishing the mic, I want to steer your attention to what, for me, has been a lifeline. The streaming of countless full productions from the archives of German theaters and opera houses. I single out German language theater because it is a primary area of research for me, but more important because it has long been distinguished by its relentless reflexivity, its ceaseless reconceptualization and restaging of the process and the politics of making and receiving art, of the relationship between stage, and backstage, live, and mediated. If I were giving a paper today, I would speak about director Ulrich Rasha, whose productions are so movingly about the work of making theater. When I say movingly, I mean that quite literally in that all his productions are set on constantly moving stages, employing either gargantuan treadmills or turntables or both. Forcing actors always to walk or sidle or march stages their bodies as engines whose sweat, tears, gasps, and spittle represent the surplus labor that both lubricates and threatens to obstruct the machinery. I especially urge you to tune into YouTube to watch his overwhelming Wojtek, perhaps the or textual indictment of the exploitation of the working classes. And those are, uh, the links are, should be in the chat stream. In the meantime, I invite you to sit back and join me in collaborating with colleagues in what is perhaps a new kind of theater whose walls may be electronic, but whose conceptual boundaries are limitless. Thank you, David. <clears throat> That was really beautiful. Uh, and our first panel will start at 11.20 and we will take a short break. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you again.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone uh, here as our first panel, Labor and Sociality. So I will hand over to our uh, moderator, uh, Ashley. Okay, here you go, Ash. Hi everyone, all right, I am unmuted. Welcome to this exciting conference. Um, thank you again to the fabulous organizers and the, um, the wonderful David Saverin for his fantastic remarks. Um, We're gonna jump in and get started with our first panel. It is Labor and Sociality. Um, our first presenter 
Uh, we have three fabulous papers, extraordinary scholar practitioners. Our first presenter is Tim Reed. Tim is an artist and he's presented work in Los Angeles at PAM Residencies, Machine Project, Highways, LAX Art and Human Resources, as well as Lynx Hall and the Chicken Coop Contemporary as part of PICA's 2018 TBA Festival. He has been an ensemble member with the Neo Futurists in Chicago and God Awful National Theater in Los Angeles and a curator at PAM Residencies and an editor with writing.org. He has a BA from the University of Chicago an MFA from Cal Arts and Writing, and in the fall will begin working toward his PhD in performance studies at NYU. The paper he's presenting today is entitled Clowns and Fung Fungibility, Fungibility, Understanding the Bird of the Birthday Party, the Bird of the Birthday Party Clown. And if you have any questions, please um, go on Twitter and hashtag networks conference and we will be able to participate. You'll be able to participate in the Q&A after. So uh, Tim, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Ash. And um, thanks everybody for, for putting this together. Um, let me see, I'm gonna share a screen. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, uh, this paper is uh, called Clowns and Fungibility, Understanding the Birth of the Birthday Party Clown. Um, after the Second World War on either side of the Atlantic, there were parallel attempts to corral the image of clowns. These figured competing sorts of copyright. In England, an informal norm space register was made of portraits of clowns painted on eggs, while in the United States, an out of work actor, Larry Harmon, licensed and franchised the character of Bozo the Clown until there are hundreds of different entertainers who look virtually identical on local stations across the country. Together, these two histories give an approach to the degraded figure of the birthday party clown, which appeared in the 1960s and 1970s. A set of anxieties attend that figure and its intimacy to the nuclear family that have led more recently to its deployment as a character of horror. But how did clowns get into homes in the first place? It has something to do with the talent of clowns for imitation and their ongoing attempt to be original. Stan Bolt was an English chemist and clown enthusiast. In 1946, he founded the International Circus Clowns Club. To honor members, he painted their made up faces on hollowed out chicken eggs. Clowns of a certain ilk, primarily event clowns hired on an individual basis rather than circus clowns who worked on contracts could now protect their personas as quote, the register created a durable archive of clown makeup designs, preserving the art form for posterity. Overseeing the archive, Bolt confirmed the uniqueness of each clown. In excess of the individual clowns depicted, the clown eggs have enjoyed their own sort of history. Since Bolt, three other enthusiasts have revived his practice of painting the portraits on eggs. Newspaper articles over the years tell the story of this register as it moved from Bolt's private collection to a restaurant in London, to a museum in Wookiee Hole near Somerset, where most of the surviving eggs have lately been kept and are on display. In 2017, a small photo book was published, which showed many of the eggs and gave quick stories of the clowns depicted. However, the book coincides with the definite waning in the membership of the English club, now renamed Clowns International. In the last several years, the club has admitted only one or two members per year, and the membership is mostly older performers. A pair of American legal scholars, David Fagundes and Aaron Perzanowski, have written on the clown egg register and the way it maintains an informal form of copyright. Ostensibly, or so the club's members have argued, the register functions to uphold the quote, unwritten rule within clowning that no clown should copy another clown's look. Curiously, the article finds that the exclusive property function is not especially operative. There was on record only one incident where a clown was encouraged to change their makeup based on a previous design. The whole register sometimes seems like a curious imitation of copyright laws, as if this group is amusingly trying on the guise of state guaranteed ownership 
it is a bit of a performance itself, which speaks to a particular a peculiar contradiction, how my mimesis and copying may actually be what's proper to clowns. The authors show, oh, in addition to the exclusive rights regulations, how the register serves non-exclusive functions which operate to organize and identify the members. The clown eggs signal cultural historical value and professional quality, foster a sense of belonging and prestige and promise some posterity. The article states that in some sense, that quote, in some sense, the register offers clowns the promise of immortality. Promise of course is different from delivery, but that promise refers to a part of the register that Fagundes and Persian Dowski don't spend a lot of time on, the eggs themselves. What if, I wonder, the register was considered as a form of performance documentation? Philip Auslander's claim that, quote, the act of documenting an event as a performance is what constitutes it as such, end quote, suggests documentation always does more than it seems. To function, the documents themselves perform specifically by their decay and the ongoing threat of their disappearance. To understand where these clowns come from, the couple hundred painted on the shells, it's necessary to dig under the makeup and look at actual eggs. The materiality of the medium must be consulted. It is the thinness of the surface of the eggs, this membrane that somehow both like skin and bone and their fragility that enables the collection to perform. Together, the set of eggs and their attempt to communicate a history produces an idea of clown, perhaps even a theory that continues to proliferate. My research is ongoing. It's no doubt harder given the current conditions. I've gone to the store, of course, and looked at the various eggs by the dozens and half dozens. I've looked at their different sizes and colors. I've talked to my friend Caitlin, who lives in Brooklyn and has three chickens, Norma, Lucy, and Nadine. Norma, who is lowest in the pecking order and has to be kept in a cage separate from the other two, makes the largest eggs, which are a beautiful blue. I spoke to a artist in Portland who runs a gallery in a chicken coop called Chicken Coop Contemporary, which Ash mentioned, where I once performed a play and was interrupted in a poignant, funny moment by a chorus of screeches and clucks. That artist, Shri, described to me how the chickens regard him, but even more his wife, Anna, and their daughter, Lily, as the rooster. And I spoke with uh, my teacher, Alex, who during this quarantine with the kids at home, ordered a set of chicks whose different breeds they picked out online from Cackle Hatchery in Missouri. The chicks arrived in a box and they'll raise them to lay. The loss the clown eggs protect against is, so the story goes, what happens to Bolt's original eggs. Painted in London, they were kept at a restaurant after Bolt's death, but in transport, a number were crushed. It's easy to imagine how. From then on, the portraits were painted on ceramic eggs meant to look like chicken eggs. A number of the destroyed originals were remade and clowns from other past eras were added. And so the claims to originality, as well as the appearance of fragility, even of hollowness, are all part of the play. In giving this appearance though, the register upholds and transmits a particular sense of clown, which goes back to the English clown, Joseph Grimaldi, famous at the beginning of the 19th century, who popularized the stock character of the clown in British pantomimes. He established the white face of the clown in a makeup pattern, which later clowns emulated and responded to. The register refers back to Grimaldi as its archon and also in the egg, holds the potential for Grimaldi's return. Of course, this all begs the question about which came first, the chicken or the egg. It is a very pre-Socratic kind of question about an anxiety of origins, of arriving at origins. The clown egg register attempted to settle that somehow, to locate an origin in a cultural history. While the norms account for an order within this group of clowns, they do not account for the relationship of this idea of the clown to the public at large. When the clown egg register caught on as an item of popular interest, it gave them a performative force that could then be drawn back to organize this group of clowns. If only clowns cared about the register, it would do no work. The consolidation of these clowns was primarily, I believe, to assert this theory of clown to ward off another era 
that would take the screen as its surface. In 1946, the same year that Bolt began painting his eggs, Alan Livingston of Capitol Records created the character Bozo the Clown for the first read-along record. A picture book accompanied the record where a clown's voice led the listener. It was voiced by Pinto Kolvig, who was also the original voice for Disney characters, including Goofy and Pluto. Bozo at the Circus was a hit, selling over a million copies and beginning a series of read-along records. The clown became the mascot of Capitol Records and was known as Bozo, the Capitol Clown. Its popularity led to a local TV show in Los Angeles with Kolvig in a starring role in a number of promotion, promotional appearances. Demand was high and additional performers had to be hired for these events. The third person hired to play Bozo was Larry Harmon, an aspiring actor and musician who after serving in the US Army during World War II had moved to Hollywood from Ohio to pursue his dream of being an entertainer. Harmon eventually played Bozo in a 1952 TV pilot called Pinky Talks Back. It was not developed into a series, but feeling some power by inhabiting that character, Harmon sensed an opportunity. In 1956, with a group of investors, he bought the rights to Bozo. He developed a series of cartoons and slightly changed the hair and costume of the live performer to better match those cartoons. He used yak hair to make the orange wig go straight out from the head and added three big white cotton balls to the front to the blue suit, adapting a touch inherited from the classic 19th century French clown Pierrot. In addition, he changed the name to Bozo, the world's greatest clown, likely after Al Jolson, his hero and icon, who was known as the world's greatest entertainer. Having made these changes, Harmon began to sell the character to local TV stations across the country. It was this act of franchising that fundamentally changed the way that clown functioned and displaced the model which the clown eggs had tried to preserve. It altered the economics and controls by which a single in individual could marshal and control the proliferation of clowns. As Harmon wrote in his memoir, I would start Bozo locally and then franchise the show like a restaurant chain or a play after it leaves Broadway. Harmon claimed to have trained over 200 separate entertainers to play Bozo. At one point, he claimed there had been over 180 concurrent productions happening at local stations across the country, including additional shows in Brazil, Thailand, Mexico, and elsewhere, each having their own live audience of local children. At some point, even Harmon, it seems, realized he was part of something he could not control. In 1965, he bought out his other original investors and claimed the rights to the read-along records as well taking sole complete ownership of Bozo. He tried to make a single show that could be nationally syndicated and never caught on. Local Bozos tended to dominate. There was Bob Bell on WGN in Chicago and Frank Abruk in Boston. And then there was Willard Scott, later famous as the weatherman on the Today Show, who Harmon trained for the local station in Washington, DC. After leaving that job, Scott was hired for an ad campaign by McDonald's and became the first Ronald McDonald in 1963. Bozo then was already reproducing on its own. In addition to this proliferation and along with other shows made for children's stations around the country, um, uh, and along with other shows made for children, stations around the country also made and produced their local, own local clown shows, many premiering before Bozo. These included J.P. Patches in Seattle, Rusty Nails in Portland, Flippy the Clown and Colonel Clown in Hartford, Connecticut, and Willie the Clown in Montgomery, Alabama. It really does go on and on. But whereas the different local clowns with their different names could be told apart, not being part of the franchise with Bozo, they really did all blur into the same and after time couldn't be told apart. The quote, unwritten rules of clowning, which the clown egg had perhaps coyly tried to assert, had been supplanted by the legal and state supported laws of copyright. In his memoir, Harm Harmon bragged, backing himself up with alliteration, quote, that he really could clone a clown. One way to state the difference between the English and US model is that with the clown eggs, there is a body and performer at the end, the art figure of Grimaldi holding the symbolic space inside the egg and so giving some animation to the design painted on the shell. Whereas for Bozo, there is no body or performer. Underneath the makeup or the gunk, as Harmon called it, is a ceramic egg, simply a body of laws. 
the image is reproduced endlessly and just needs a body or life so the image has a screen to project itself on. This is the situation which makes the birthday party clown possible and a little unnerving. Otherwise interchangeable, the performer simply steps into the place of the commodity. Alongside the cake and balloons and toys, there is this other thing, and that thing is alive. Marx writes, quote, as soon as it emerges as a commodity, it changes into a thing which transcends sensuousness. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and it evolves out of its wooden brain's grotesque ideas, far more wonderful than if it were to begin dancing of its own free will, end quote. Such is the life of a true entertainer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was fascinating. And I really appreciated your images as well. Um, once again, a reminder to anybody who's just joining us, um, you can ask questions of our panelists if, on Twitter at TalRound with hashtag networks2020. There's also Facebook Live and Instagram. Um, we're going to move on to our next presenter, Hui Peng. Uh, Hui Peng completed her MA in Theory and Literature at the University of Lisbon in Portugal and MA in Theater and Performance Studies at State University of New York in Buffalo. As a theater director, her recent environmental work, Nietzsche Goes Bananas Here, premiered in July 2018 at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Shanghai. Hui's research explores spectatorship, participatory art, and digital humanities. Hui has presented at national conferences on theater, dance, and cultural studies. Her paper is entitled The Commitment and Commitment Return in Remedy Protocols Remote Macau. Thank you so yeah. much, Hui. The floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So on um, this paper, this conference paper actually is derived from uh, my past article. So, but now I'm still um, kind of like smash down it and making in another article. So I'm looking for another performance which has the same parameter and I want to do a comparative study uh, in terms of talking about the uh, race taking in interactive and participatory theater. So I'm really looking forward to your feedback and comments. Yes, so Remote Macau derives from Remote, Mac, uh, Remote X, a theater project created in 2013 in Berlin by Rumini Protocol. As the official website indicates, as means different city, quote, as the project tours from city to city, each new site specific version builds upon the dramaturgy of the previous cities, end quote. I consider Remote Acts to be a theater theorist that has always been adapted or even updated, but each iteration is not a commodification towards perfection because different versions are strictly dependent on the city's infrastructure, transportation, urban planning, public policy, and among others. Every version is unique and non-reproducible. Remote Macau is a Macau version created in 2017, adapted from the original archetype Remote Berlin in 2013, as well as the previous city's version. It is a site-specific version in, for, and of the city Macau. In Remote Macau, the stage is the city itself. There are no trained live actors who are prepared to perform for the audience member Given a pair of headphones, around 30 audience members and I are directed by the voice to wander around downtown Macau in terms of when to go, where to go, and even how to go. As one of the audience members, my experience is mainly dependent on the voice instruction. This machine live voice is available in three languages, Mandarin, Cantonese, and English, in which I chose the channel of English. I commit to the voice through obeying almost every directive from it ranging from staring at the photo on the tombstone, taking a selfie in the mirror of street corner, stage a running race in the school, and dancing in the commercial plaza. At the final location of Remote Macau, a rooftop at Skyscraper, the voice releases its ultimate order to jump off this building. Obviously, nobody jumped. However, this suicidal order suggests a kind of imbalance between my commitment to the voice and the commitment return. 
So in this conference paper, through an autoethnographic lens, I examined the activation that urged me to keep responding to the voice, either in a sensorial or physical way. I argue that there is an other response feedback system that encourages spectator participant to keep committing to the voice without considering the immediate commitment return. Jeremy Pao, Jane McGonigal, Claire Bishop, and Josephine Moncom I argue that the non-jump decision still situates well in the feedback system, but it declares the collapse of the system in itself. Lastly, I can see remote Macau as a case study that could contribute to the discussion of race-taking, interactive, and participatory theater. So before analyzing the feedback system, the voice itself needs to be examined in scrutiny. This embody machine-like, unnatural, unnatural, creepy, this adjective burns out when I recall the voice in remote Macau. Actually, the voice is, quote, reconstituted from some 2,500 words of previously recorded voice by software that reads to the blind, end quote. The voice experienced a gender transformation throughout the performance. It was female at the beginning, turned into a male in the middle, and remained so until the end. However, the categorization of other is dependent on the location rather than the gender. What interests me is that either veiled by a female or male persona, the voice maintains itself as a subject who could motivate and activate the spectator or participant to respond to its other. Quote, I have no lips, I have no mouth, I have no head, end quote, the voice exclaimed. The voice does not intend to hide its ontological ambiguity. This machine-like whisper, this haunting murmuring is somehow difficult to capture in the nowis or in Peggy Fillon's work, it lived in this vanished presence. The voice become itself through this experience. So from the perspective of the ambiguous voice, how does this ephemeral fleeting existence interact with the living people in an active way? Besides the supportive and caring role it plays, such as gu guiding through hazardous roads, offering reminder about the car flow, and sometimes anticipating the waiting second of the traffic light. What is the essence of the activation rendered by the voice that eventually pushed all the spectator participant to a risky ending? In the book, Reality is Broken, Why Game Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World, game designer and performance scholar Jane McGonigal introduced the powerful feedback system of games, which is capable of absorbing people's intensive concentration and maintaining their motivation to play in games. For Jane, the feedback system is a promise for the player, which has two key elements. First, it always has a clear goal. Second, it indicates actionable next steps. James' analysis on feedback system shares light on the other response mechanism in remote Macau. The other in remote Macau include airy direction from the headphones, such as 100 degree turn right, raise your left hand, sit on the floor. This straightforward directive are concrete and clear, specifying the spectator a series of actionable next steps. Given this, the spectator participants are easy to follow and capable of accomplishing every small task. In doing so, they are endowed with a strong sense of agency and a possible feeling, sometimes even an optimism. They are rewarded by the possible positive feedback loop of the system and are prepared to tackle upcoming level of task. The concreteness and clearness of the order are a guarantee of a motivation in remote Macau. Other times when the order seems to take time, such as choose someone to have eye contact with or find one of your belongings that show your personality, the voice demonstrates its patience and understanding. Counting the seconds or playing music to ensure everyone in the audience collective follows direction. In these circumstances, the slightly tougher tasks are not directly broken down into actionable steps, but its difficulty and flexibility is within a setable spectrum. Even though some of them fail to complete a task, they will keep engaging with the performance space uh, because on the one hand, they, are, they have been rewarded in their previous completed action, and on the other, the essence of the feedback system is not about success in itself, but a powerful drive to succeed. Jane vividly explained that in a good computer game, the player are always playing on the very edge of their skill level, always on the blink of falling off. The falling failure is fun and enjoyable and is what motivates the player with a better hope of success. Quote, winning tends to end the fun, but failure, it keeps the fun going, end quote. 
and remote Macau. Similarly, even though some spectator failed to complete a tougher task, the state of being intensely engaged may ultimately be more pleasurable than even the satisfa satisfaction of winning. So the fun failure are what make their theater experience unique rather than a proof of their incapability. They can, of course, try their best to complete every order emitted by the voice, but if they miss some of them, these failures are still fossil fuels that pump them up to continue the loop of the feedback system. In sum, either success or failure, both could be conceived as an activation that keep, keep them engaging in the performance. So the feeling of activation is concretized in two ways. One is a series of actionable next step. The other is a motivation to succeed in completing the step. Given these two reasons, as one of the spectators, I conceive myself becoming what art history and performance scholar Claire Bishop calls an active subject, a subject who is empowered by the experience of physical or symbolic participation. I embody an augmented perceived autonomy of self-governing and independent, independent decision-making. But concretely, in any given moment during the performance, I can decide for myself whether to take out the headphone, listen to the voice, and respond to this other. I can decide for myself the kinds and degrees of participation in performance. And the article, Audience Participation and Neoliberal Value, Risk, Agency, and Responsibility in Immersive Theater, scholar Adam Alston states that, quote, the demand made of audience to do something are stretch and magnify immersive theater, end quote. Although remote Macau is not a typical example of immersive theater, it still meets the criteria of all what Alston mentioned as the audience demanding endeavor. In remote Macau, my magnified effort mainly results from two strings. One is the augmented sensory, the other is the physical mobility. Considering the increased effort is significantly crucial to pinpoint or at least delineate what is the archetype of being a spectator. Only in doing so could we understand how much is increased or magnified. However, unlike other quantitative, uh, quali quantitative research in humanity and social science, in particular in theater and performance study, it's not easy to art articulate the alpha and omega of a particular model. That is why I take my embodied ex experience as a case study. I believe the commitment that I will articulate at length is extremely subjective and partial. But on the other side, my empirical experience is also unique and unreproducible, which is not a phase that resembles the whole performance, but a valid entry point to approach a comprehensive picture of remote Macau. First, my commitment derives from the augmented sensory awareness. As usual, in con concurrence with what I do in my traditional mode of watching, I prioritize the oral and visual. Given this, I pay extreme attention to the voice and its order. Directed by them, I was asked to stare at a photo on the tombstone, watch a live show across the street, and observe the passing commuter daily behavior. What differentiates spectating in remote Macau from that of the traditional theater is that I observe from within rather than watch watching from outside. I was in an experience of spectating. My five senses are acti activated with augmented sensitivity. With heightened sensory awareness, I can feel the temperature of the, up the afternoon, humidity in the air, and hear the unnoticeable, unnoticeable sound from the street corner. I became what performance scholar Robin Nelson calls an experiencer, who was characterized by the broadly visceral sensory encounter in spectating. Based on this experiential spectating, I take the initiative to do the meaning making rather than merely selecting, comparing, and interpreting what is present presented for me. In remote Macau, I made those random passing commuter into a character and break them into a narrative. The sirens of the car and the rumbling from the local market I incorporate into the background music of my character. The moldy shadow of the tree, the vivid red in the banner, and the trace of the rust at the bottom of the streetlight are props of ready-made in the story. The experiential spectating supported by my sensory involvement is what I commit to the performance as an experiencer. Second, my commitment derives from my physical engagement. In remote Macau, as mentioned, there are no trained live actor who perform for us. Under the command of the voice, the spectator executes a repertoire of action. In other words, they play a character role directed and shaped by the voice. In a review of remote London, theater critic Matt Truman questioned, questioned quote, who needs actor anymore, end quote. 
in responding to this, York Karen Bauer, an artist who had worked with Rimini Protocol since 2005 said, quote, if there is a story to tell, why not let the people that experienced that story tell it themselves, end quote. Given this response, the spectator with headphones on were asked by the voice to take on the role of actor and tell their own story in Bruno Macau. The reason for addressing the performer spectator autonomy is the presupposition of the two, the performer on the stage in a conventional theater comparing to the sitting audience member are more likely physically active or in Josephine Mancon's turn, the traditional actor customarily take the responsibility of a direct involvement through body and bodily movement, ranging from vocal expression to corporal action. Given this role setting in Ramon Macau, my commitment derives from taking on the responsibility of a traditional actor. With every other, I embody an urge to respond to it, that is to take an immediate action. The action requires a certain degree of physical engagement. From the Michael Scott, the engagement includes but not limited to walking, dancing, jumping, and running. The body exhaustion reminds me of the labor within this physical engagement. From the Michael Scott, the roots start from the San Miguel Cemetery and ends in the Sky 21 bar and the restaurant. The straight line distance is roughly 0.8 mile between the beginning and ending point, but the actual route for the participants is much more further. The nearly 90 minutes rolling in downtown Macau creates mobility, which attests to the physical investment of the performance. The bodily movement and mobility are how I respond to the voice in a physical way, taking on the role of traditional actor. Here we see an implicit ethical problem from the voice because it requests a potential bodily reaction and action, which possibly could be precarious. The system is cultivated and matures through the spectator participant's response, either in a sensorial or physical way. The commitment and commitment return are not the equation because not every commitment return is concrete and definable. The relationship between the two is more like an analyst self-sufficient circle. The order before the final suicide of jumping suits well and nourish the system. However, the final jumping destabilized and even disrupt the self-sufficient feedback loop. I now focus on the final jumping order and see where to pinpoint it within this other response system through two distance perspective. From the perspective of the maker of the system, that is the Rimini protocol and the local assistant director of Rimo Macau. The jumping is the last order in the performance and the performance moved to the end with other jump of this building. The artist did not expect a response to the jumping order. Moreover, they endeavor to prevent an immediate response to the order. According to an interview with the assistant director of Ramon Macau, he explained that in total, seven coordinators at a final location were on standby and guaranteed the spectator participant were not going to jump up the building. Actually, there are five coordinators hidden in the audience group throughout the performance, and there are two other ones waiting in the final location. So for the artist, the jumping order was a scripted non-jump in Ramon Macau. For the, for, from the perspective of the spectator participant, the final order is only many orders during the performance, such as move backwards, sit on the floor, take a selfie. It seems not to be an unusual one towards which the spectator participant would pay extra attention or consideration. They could decide for themselves whether to respond and to what degree they respond to the voice. Within the feedback system, what should be illuminated is that the relationship between the pairs of other response is consecutive rather than causal. By this, I mean my response to the previous order cannot influence the next order given. The order from the voice are pre-recorded program-like setting, which is independent of my reaction and action. My response to the voice will only influence my consequence modes and manners of, of response. In this sense, the order response mechanism is more like a chain of order that looks forward to potential response. The point is not how do the spectator participant get to the moto jumping. The jumping is already there. It will be released as soon as the spectator participant arrive at a certain time space. The point is always how they respond to the voice. 
As mentioned, no spectator literally drawn up the building. The inactive actions refused to drum up the building. It's somehow different from the previous sensorial as well as physical response. The rejection is a complete denial of the order rather than a lower degree of engagement and participation. Rejecting to jump up the building declares a collapse of the feedback system. The spectators, participants' vulnerability, and self-blaming resonate assistance breakdown. After all, no commitment, no commitment return. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, that was fascinating and insightful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and welcome to our friends, scholars, and practitioners, and students, and everyone else who are joining us from around the world. If you're just tuning in, um, you can ask questions of our presenters on Twitter at, at HowlRound, hashtag Networks2020. Uh, you can also ask questions on Facebook Live and on Instagram if you um, go to the PhD department, CUNY Graduate Center's PhD in theater department, um, you can send messages. Uh, we have one more presenter in our section. I'm going to uh, introduce Cara Novella. She's a performing artist, researcher, and doctoral candidate in performance studies at UC Davis, working at the intersection of socially engaged art, dance, improvisation, installation, visual poetry, and performance art. Insisting in movement practices and material textures, her work bundles health and politics and takes form in workshops, community process-based events, performances, site installations, sensory more than human explorations, texts and teachings. She is the creator of Onco Girls 2011 to ongoing and multi-species platform co-sensing. Her paper is entitled on co-creation, a practice-based interrogation on labor and socially, socially engaged performance. Caro, thank you so much. The floor is all yours. Uh, ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, so much, Ashley, for your introduction and for everybody for your hard work putting this conference together. And thank you all for being here. Barcelona, May 2013. I reunited a group of eight women and queer folks to make a performance about our cancer experiences. It was the first Onco Girls Creative Residency, a project that I launched in 2011 to make cancer performances with others. On the first day of the rehearsal, we all shared our cancer stories and some of its pains. Through the conversation, we discovered that we all had, in one form or another, been put aside of living. Our doctors had enacted, enacted variations of the advice, now place your life in a parenthesis and only care about your health. As an initial stage to the creative process, we came up with the question, what are we waiting for? And for, a, for over a month, we moved with the notion of waiting. Throughout the rehearsal sessions, we uncovered and shared the intimate pains of the disease, particularly the pain of having our bodies handed and parsed as mere objects, the rage of having others, beside on and excise us from our, from our desires, the trauma of isolation and the ages of having to set a life aside. Throughout the process of making the performance piece, parenthesis, we animated new cancer questions, touched and moved each other with care and engaged in a larger than ourselves process of creation, where we transformed the waiting into engaged curiosity and joint creation. Despite I had been doing work on health, performance and social change for a few years by then, in the making of the piece parenthesis, I realized of the potential in rehearsal. Even though it was a rehearsal for a performance, the rehearsal itself turned into the change process. Imagine this, 
you are one of the participants in the creative process. Instead of diagnosis, prognosis, and prescriptions of medical treatments and protocols, you are invited to ask the questions that matter to you and to take a field trip into your process of change. Are given the tools for attending to the physiological transformations and for noticing the many bodily processes happening. Your bodies are not attacking you, but are in tune with and responding to ecological conditions and generating profound social change. This invitation even extends to people and friends who also care about cancer relations, breaking isolation. Imagine you are invited to actively participate in a process of joint discovery where not knowing becomes a platform to play with expectations or even a space of relief where moral, social, family, labor, sexual, medical, dot, 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 obligations are softened, released, turned upside down. Imagine that uncertainty is not to be treated but embraced as a, space, as a space for engaged curiosity and play. This is what rehearsal can offer to people living with cancer. And let's face this, there is no escape. We are all already living with and alongside cancer. Taking Michelle Murphy's concept, we are already living altered lives. Besides the increasing numbers of cancer incidents in the world, Cancer has spread into our existences as a material metaphor for the worst, a kind of somatorelational technique of horror, and as a, as a mode of engaging health, toxicity, economics, research, and all kinds of life on earth through fixed notions of hope and fear. Trust me, as a person who has been in the oncologist's office more than one, I know that neither this kind of hope or this kind of fear are allowing for living and dying well. We might as well fight for changing the kind of relations possible and end with some of the pains of cancer uncertainty. Who knows, even with some of the causes. While cancer is recognized under the umbrella of disability, as theater scholar and cancer activist Brian Lovell notes, in terms of activism and mobilization, cancer and chronic illnesses are still mostly confined to the medical individual model of disability, where, open quote, it continues to be seen primarily as a personal problem afflicting individual people, a problem best solved through strength of character and resolve, end quote. And cancer performance is, Lovell says, for the most part, an individual experience. In cancer performance, an incipient pool of scholars looking at cultural texts and art and performance works engage with these solo pieces as both dealing with individual issues and also aiming at critical engagement with discursive structures. I hope to contribute to this pool of performance scholars by looking at rehearsal and at joint cancer performance making. To move from an emphasis on performance to rehearsal, I turn to the literature, literature on socially engaged practice. Despite the divide between social disruption and social bond pres present in current social practice debates, performance scholars, performance studies scholar, Shannon Jackson proposed to tend to how art practices contribute to processes of interdependent social imagining. Aware that many critics mistrust feel-good collaborative performance as lacking social antagonism, I hope to contribute a situated, situated practice in cancer performance making that offers a both end response where co-creation animates a soft mode of social antagonism. This piece is, a, is part of a chapter of my practices research dissertation in which I articulate the main principles and practices of rehearsal as method. And I ask, how does rehearsal as method engage individuals in joint exploration and creation of new cancer relations while making performance pieces? 
what are some of the practices and principles, how and why they work. I will, mean, I will briefly mention them all now, but I will center the rest of this presentation on mostly co-creation. First principle, I name it score inquiry, not resolution. This principle aims to frame the whole creative process as an open and settling exploration that never aims to tell a story or find one only solution. This principle insists on ongoing curiosity and asks what else throughout the process. It avoids jumping ahead the process with explanations of what the piece should be about and avoid suffocating other people's curiosity with projections and interpretations. Instead of aiming to find one solution or to make one critique, this principle could also be described as keeping curiosity as enough. The second principle is ground in the somatic experience and always return to the bodily doings. The third principle uh, or practice, I, it's transpose and I score it as move it somewhere else and see what happens. It's a mechanism that anchors the process as an exploration. And finally, the, princi the principle that I call on co-creation, uh, that it's a fun play of words um, with oncology and co-creation. And I name it, let's do something about it and let's do it together. So co-creation is an approach specific to the task of and individualizing and animating networks in response to the isolated and individual cure orientation of biomedical experiences. In response to the alienation of being separated from society, attending to co-creation aims to do something about it and do it together. is a mode of production that anchors the process in the group through the practices to distribute ownership and nurture response ability. Over the years, I have developed some practices to further co-creation, such as centering the group's question, start with a potluck, practice contagion, and hold it all. I developed some of the practical challenges and institutional limitations to co-creation later on, but now, what does co-creation look like? Del por qué a mí, al por qué a tantas. Or from the why me, to the why so many. This story follows the four stages uh, of co-creation in a multi-city laboratory held in Spain. In 2016, a group of people meeting in Zaragoza addressed and opened up the question to cancer, why me? I'm gonna look at each stage of co-creation. So the first one, start from their question or avoid being the sole researcher. I asked the four groups in this multi-city laboratory to send a how question that they would ask cancer. I collected all the questions and distributed them to other groups as a relational technique to connect the explorations across cities. The question posed by the organizer in Granada traveled to the group in Zaragoza. Yet, instead of a how question, we received why me? A demand that centers the individual in origin cause stories. We embrace the challenge and took this question as an opportunity to create practices to open to more than one and soften the bounded medical individual. Number two, start with a podleg and share strengths, assets, locations, networks, experiences, or avoid being the sole producer, organizer, director. We met with everyone for the first time at Marta's apartment. Monica, Leticia, Bea, Jesus, Marta, myself, and Kevin, a Canadian choreographer and friend who joined this local exploration. We cooked together, ate together, and talked. We shared our stories, discussed the schedule, and approached Why Me for the first time with a collaborative writing exercise. Through the exercise, the image of a traveling nipple emerged. 
as well as many words and buzzing rhythms that continued with us throughout the project. Monica and Leticia had been booking community spaces to rehearse and Monica brought the materials for our exploration. Leticia taught us to sign the sentence, I bet my nipple to grow. Three, practice contagion and swap authors, infect each other, diffuse borders, or avoid being the sole facilitator, dramaturg, or editor. Once in the studio, Kevin, Kevin shared some touch-based practices. He called them the tenderizing score and the moving with and away the touch, as practices to soften the borders of our bodies. I shared a drawing practice as a mode for each of us to return to the group with what we notice without too many words. We did a jamming poetry exercise inspired by the work of Pucha Nostra with the images and words emerging from the previous touching base course. Kevin and I designed a drawing session, a drawing version of the implosion score by our mentors, Joe Dumit, Donna Haraway, and engaged the nipple in the world and the world in the nipple. This implosion practice is an exercise that unpacks objects and teases open the economic, economic technical, political, organic, historical, mythic, and textual threads that open up its tissues, end quote, Harway in, says Harway. Once we finished the implosion score, and before we could move into a new somatic and movement practice, everyone starts talking about their own medicines. The self-referential pool is extremely strong in current in biomedical, well, it's extremely strong in current biomedical dealing with life and death. To rearouse the relational world we had just opened up, we offered an impromptu humming practice in which a storm of spoken poetic images became the rhythmic background for an spontaneous altar making practice. Okay for principle of co-creation, hold it all and avoid simplification or avoid being the sole storyteller. As a closing exercise, we aimed to compose a living image tableau with our cancer care objects, an onco sanctuary to hold our experience. We started by making room in the studio for an altar. We hung the piece of drawing that emerged from the implosion score as a sort of headstand. Then we cleaned the floor, installed a red carpet as an inviting device to enter into our world and placed a chair in the middle. Once we had the space ready, we collected all of our objects of care in the middle of the carpet. To continue the practice with a softened focus and a relational attention to the whole we then yielded the touch score, moving with and away the touch into a gentle dance with objects while we posed them all within the space. In a slow and lengthy unchoreographed dance, we aroused an ecology of care and obligation that extends beyond the why me question, a mobilization of bodily exposures that challenge how self and causality currently operate in cancer relations and offer by posing a manifold composition, a soft mode of joint and vulnerable resistance. So now what can co-creation do or why co-creation? Leticia and Marta shared these questions, now what? And from why me to the why so many in a fanzine that we made that collects images, scores, texts, and reflections emerging from rehearsal processes in Zaragoza. I'm gonna read Leticia's quote. This, proce this process started, open quote, this process started with the big question of why me? A question surrounded by fear and responsibility, loads that this society brings upon us, diagnosed individuals. The time and bonds built with people 
with own coaffinity has allowed me to transit new paths of trust, liberation, and sorority with other bodies who also denounce the self-referentiality in cancer and other diseases. Now, other questions emerge. What is social responsibility? The political responsibility of those who immerse us in stress and productivity dynamics of harmful alimentation and polluted spaces. How will the medical system and the medical coverage, coverage access to health evolve? Okay, so as Leticia recounts how the process, the time and the bonds develop, the center the question towards a form of socio-political critique. While Marta's quote that I haven't read extends an invitation to the reader to join oncologist groups and work together until there is no trace of carcin carcinogen products left on earth. We notice in their stories how the process of rehearsing together changes the focus from the why me question to an outward look into the world, a mobilization outward through being together. Transfeminist scholar Judy Butler writes about vulnerability as resistance in brief in reference to groups of activists taking the streets, being exposed as a mode of resistance to recover the right to be in the street. She has also thought with disability poet and activist Sunaira, Sunaira Taylor on disability vulnerability as public space resistance. Thinking with them allows me to articulate on co-creation as a form of resistance where bodily and affective vulnerabilities are actually mobilized to resist the individualism and isolation imposed by cancer relations. This, despite the spaces of joint performance making are not necessarily public squares, and onco creation mostly happens in the space time of rehearsal studio, in attending to togetherness, let's do something about it and let's do it together, we also occupy the material symbolic space of cancer, of cancer land, and entangle it with the world. On co-creation, we thread a network of joint exploration that enables worlding cancer together, differently. We break the spell of medicalization, enabling cancer performance to move into a kind of cancer activism. Some of the debates for either some of the debates for either social critique or social bond in the field of social engaged performance are grounded in assumptions that either reduce collaborative work to feel good, monolithical, acritical, and therefore easily instrumentalized initiatives, or that reduce the political potentiality of art making to its antagonist capacity to raise awareness of larger discursive structures. In rehearsal as method, co-creation is not only a feel-good collaborative gesture, but a formal and political experiment to resist the individual spell of current biomedical cancer relations. On the one hand, being together in a creative generative space is already enacting cancer socialities otherwise, offering a joint response to the dominant biomedical and cultural expectations of individuals living with cancer. In this sense, on co-creation is somehow aligned with performative politics of protest and direct action, as Jackson, Shannon Jackson uh, reminds us. On the other hand, a soft form of social antagonism also emerges through shared inquiry, a process that asks questions beyond individual bounded positions and pure narratives that holds multiple and co-imbricated realities without erasing difference. To finish, these days I am currently training students on methods for community performance and social change through Zoom. I pull from the lessons learned in a decade of joint performance making on living with cancer or what I call on co-creation. As I reflect on these lessons, a question that I become more and that is becoming more and more relevant is so what does cancer offer to rehearsal as method and to the field of social engaged performance? One of the most clear offerings in these times is a training on living through really high stakes of life death uncertainty. Another might be the depth of shared exposure that turns on co-creation into a profound commitment to social change as a survival mechanism. 
Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your paper and for your work. That's really important, important socially engaged work. And I'm excited to talk more about it and to take questions. Um, we actually, we have about 10 minutes now. We're gonna open up the floor to questions. Um, again, anybody, for anybody who's joining us, our friends around the world, our scholars and performance friends, um, you can ask questions on Twitter. If you go, if you hashtag networks, networks 2020 at HowlRound, uh, there's also a live Facebook feed. So I'm gonna, I'm searching all of the different social, <laughs> social media sites for questions as they come to me. I don't see anything quite yet, but I do wanna keep the conversation going. Um, we have, oh, we have 15 to 20 minutes for your Q&A. Thank you, Rajao. Um, so I'm gonna, just to keep the conversation going, um, I will ask the first question. I have questions for all of you, but I hope others will join in as well. And I'm gonna keep, um, keep encouraging people, especially those who are just joining us uh, to hashtag networks 2020 on Twitter um, and ask questions in the live Facebook feed. And I will relay them to our presenters. So Caro, I, I mean, I'm so moved by your work. Um, I've been thinking about vulnerability as resistance, co-creation as resistance, um, and resisting individualism and isolation. These all, for me, it's like this uh, performance and co-creation as resistance to capitalism and our internalized capitalism, what that does to us, um, you know, on, on the personal level. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now, the whole world is talking about illness and isolation, and um, we are turning to technology, like like at this conference, um, to, to remedy some of that. Um, how can technology play a role in, like in, in your work that you've done? How could you use technology in the future to maybe engage people or engage people with cancer who are isolated? who um, might not be able to be, you know, be together in a, in a space. Um, it's similar now with COVID, like how, how would you use technology or have you used technology? Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, thank you for your comments and thank you for this question. Um, yeah, I am actually, I am currently using uh, technology, as I was saying, on the one side, I am training on how to build community performance and how to make community through COVID through students. But also, uh, I have already been doing some some online work, I guess, not live, not Zoom live. Uh, but one method that that we've been already using is like scoring, like creating scores that we can pass on and, other, and others can like play with right so yeah. like it's technology like the zoom technology but also the scores as, as technology are could be considered as platforms as opening platforms to engage questions in a more playful or pleasure oriented uh, manner yeah so for instance in one of the laboratories on Kogels, we created a series of scores for performing beyond medicalization. And those scores are already posted online and they are a series of uh, poetic images and that invite to for, to, for instance, transit the skin membrane. Uh, so I invite, thank you for the opportunity, but I invite anybody who wants to think differently about isolation and illness to play with this score. What would, be, what would be transiting the skin membrane mean? Or how can we, how can you in your home mm, play with materials, play with your space and your body and open up this core, make a piece, share it with others, share it through Zoom, open up mm, conversations, game, game spaces even. Great. Um, and I encourage also our other participants to jump in the conversation. We can have, um, you know, 
we can be informal as informal as we can be on Zoom, but um, you know, please also propose questions to each other as well. Um, Tim, I have a question for you, just coming from um, one of the various social media outlets. Um, we'd love to hear more about the eggs. And actually, I had written that down as well. Um, I'm specifically interested in race and clown makeup and like how, you know, we're, how does race inform the makeup? Um, does it, you know, and um, speak a little bit more about the paintings of the eggs as well. Sure. Um, I mean, I think, um, I think the eggs starting in England um, coming from this guy Grimaldi at the early 19th century. Um, it began, uh, um, you know, there's this thing of the white face and like mm -hmm. doing the white face and makeup hadn't always been a part of clown. Like it's not like a necessary part of thing, part of clown. So part of what I'm tracking is um, the, uh, how, how makeup and a kind of face design became part of this practice like so much now that it's hard to imagine a clown in some way like whatever the traditional or uh, kind of cliched version of clown without makeup so so absolutely it, it was like a white thing it's like the the makeup in the early clown thing like that group is basically um in england started as um that and it became there's like a how to tell the story. I mean, in the 19th century, there was kind of like this, like clown was this kind of like high status guy. And it was kind of like this, a little bit authoritarian figure and it was white face, no nose. And it became like a pretty, uh, almost like a parody of kind of the, the, the high status. Um, and then late 19th century, like, like in the US, you had the beginning of like minstrelsy and all that stuff, which kind of bled into clowns eventually in the US. Um, but then there started to be duos, like a high status, low status duo. And that was, the low status was often called the red. And, um, and it was definitely like racialized. Um, and so in a way, and then it changed again um, in the 20th century. But in a way the eggs were this kind of like um, retro move to kind of shore up a certain kind of version of clown from the 19th century, a more traditional one that was aligned with with this um, a pretty traditionally white figure um, and kind of collect folks underneath that. I mean, then when it got to the US for sure, I mean, it was, um, it got to the US, like these bozo figures were like almost all like these kind of burly white guys, like a little bit big white guys. And that became this kind of like standard, um, you know, the, the kind of matter that you could make and paint over that. Um, so, um, yes, how's that? <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. And um, Hui, I was curious about gender and we were talking about the machine voices and the experiences of um, the, the spectator participants. Um, I was curious if you had thoughts around if they, um, it, cause you mentioned that these, these machine voices didn't have a particular gender, if they were to gender these voices, do you think it, how would it have informed the work? Yeah, actually, uh, I kind of like tackle a little bit about the gender issue in this pieces, but because of the length of this paper, I kind of like cut it out, but I can just address a little bit. So actually there, you can tell the, the, the gender transformation from the beginning to the end. It was a uh, female voice at the beginning and then turning to male and then remain so at, at the end. And it also like at the beginning of the performance, um, so the voice says, oh, I will be your girlfriend in, in the future. And at the end, it's the female voice that I will be the girlfriend in your future. I will tell you which shoes fit, fits on, uh, what color fits suits you. And then at the end is the male voice that kind of like emits this um, suicidal order to jump off, jump off this building. But um, as I mentioned in the paper, the order, the categorization of order actually is a location based rather than gender based because during the performance, the female voice, the female personnel also ask people to do dangerous things. For example, when we are uh, arrive in the old pedestrian bridge and then the female voice asks us to jump. But I mean, it's just like, it's that kind of jumping is not dangerous, but 
there are some passing commuters stop and stare at us. So, and then for the male voice, it also kind of like provided with us a pleasurable uh, point of view to look at the city. So actually I feel like I don't want to kind of like uh, reinforce the gender stereotype in terms of like female uh, the nose uh, assistantship and care. And then the, the male uh, means that is dangerous and commands actually because the categorization of other is not gender based. But yes, as, as you mentioned, making the female voice as default, it kind of like reinforced that, um, okay, like for example, like uh, historically the, the job of a secretary or administrative are relegated to, to the women. Um, but yes, but the gender issue, I don't think is that crucial in terms of the categorization of the other, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, and just again, for our friends around the world who are just joining us or tuning in on social media, um, you can ask questions of our panelists at um, hashtag networks on Twitter, uh, networks, sorry, networks 2020 and at HowlRound. We also have a live Facebook feed. Um, everyone's been quiet, so. Um, Actually, I have a question yes, for Carol. Yes. Yeah. So I was particular, thank you for this amazing work. I was so moved when I was listening and reading. So I was curious about, because you mentioned um, rehearsal as methods. So I was particularly interesting about um, the way that you archive all the rehearsal. So can you talk a little bit about the archive and repertoire in this rehearsal process? Mm. It's been 10 years yeah. of rehearsal practices. So tons of journaling, tons of uh, audiovisual work. So I'm talking about the material archive. <laughs> uh, uh, there's like a block where I've been very bad to continue uploading material, but there's even, so in terms of archiving, to me has been very important to upload not only final pieces, final performances, but snap, snap, snaps or, or parts of the rehearsals, right? So there's like in the blog, you can see um, which questions we had at some moment and which practice we would make to animate that question, for instance. Or, yeah, yeah. So is uh, there is there one person take the full responsibility, full responsibility of archiving or everybody is participating? Uh, okay, I took the full responsibility of carrying on with the blog. <laughs> uh, but there's been many ways. So, okay, I've just shared my way of like mm, the archive that I kind of like have with me, but every participant in the, in the, in the project has had different forms. So for instance, we made a fanzine in Zaragoza uh, and that got, so it's in, wait, when you say responsible for archiving, you mean to keeping it or to? Like, um, so I think it's the, so because uh, you kind of, uh, so there are some like quotes from the parti uh, partitioner. So I just wonder how does it work? Like, are you doing interview with them or you kind uh -huh. of like propose a question and then you have a like okay, talk? So how does it go? So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so these scopes that I shared were actually pieces, they're public, they're like written pieces of the participants in this newsletter that we made in mm. Zaragoza, not this letter, uh, as in. So, yeah, so I've basically, or for instance, there's one video, so some of the, so if I get quotes, they're like from public materials most of the time. Mm. So it's, yeah. I have not been doing interviews because I was not, so yeah, because I was really interested in the process on how, and yeah, I don't know. Thank you, yeah. I have a, I have a question from, we yeah. have a question from one of our faculty members, uh, Erica Lynn, and this question is for everyone. All your papers deal in different ways with the, um, the way embodied action produces particular affects. How much of that affect can and should be understood as labor? And what are the implications of understanding it that way? And thank you, Erica, for submitting a question. I mean, 
mean, I, I guess my, I would, I'll start and just say that, um, and maybe this connects to thinking a little bit of, we in your, like kind of walking around with the voice in the head and, and following those commands. And so maybe the way I'm thinking about the clowns or the birthday party clown is like, it's this, there's this not embodiment and a bit of the labor is just like, um, it involves everything, like the whole body and like dragging the whole body around. And then that produces, there's that, like when a body is in a place where a body isn't meant to be, like how does that produce a kind of, um, how does that um, <clears throat> sort of disorganize a, a kind of social space and then and then the need to kind of like keep it together through that um, and that kind of like ongoing um, practice. So um, I guess in that space, like the affect is kind of like in the social relation and kind of what's needed effectively to kind of like keep um, some kind of organization or, or a, um, I want to say <clears throat> to, to not let it all fall apart and everybody kind of like run away screaming. Yeah, thank you for uh, Erika's question because this kind of like question keep coming back when I'm writing this, um, drafting this conference paper because uh, I was saying that I want to um, find another case study with the same parameters and put it together to do a comparative study in terms of the risk taking in uh, interactive participatory uh, theater. And uh, in remote Macau, the final jumping, jump up this building is absolutely significant in that piece. But I mean, I think in terms of considering the affect, I think I should frame it like more, like how to say, to more, um, to be more concise of the turn. Actually, in remote Macau, that kind of risk is um perception of risk, or is a perception of risk, or is a perceived risk. So I think that should be um, uh, like, articulate at length. Like that kind of risk is not a concrete, and. Uh, how to say concrete objective being is a kind of like perception of risk. Yeah. Can I ask a question about that moment? I'm just curious, yeah. like, like your relation to the other audience members at that, yeah. like how you like, cause you must've all like checked in, like, are you gonna do it? Are you? Yeah. You know, that was so interesting. So actually before that uh, final jumping, actually we, we have done some like dangerous things during this whole process. As I mentioned in that old pedestrian bridge, we kind of like jump and then the bridge shake heavily for several seconds. Although it's not dangerous for, it's not actual, kind of, kind of produce an actual dangerous, but there are some passing commuters stared at us. But the thing is that we are, we laughed, we're checking with each other and we enjoy this illegitimate pleasure. <laughs> And I think that kind of like illegitimate pleasure make up keep committing to the voice until the final jumping scenario. And in that scenario, like we're kind of like shocked. I, I was shocked personally. And then I look at the people next to me and then they're like have a question mark in their face. But I mean, nobody jump, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So yes. And so that is something very interesting at the final scenario, scenario. I have a question that just came in and I think this might be our last question uh, before we wrap up. This is from Jonid, who is one of our PhD students at the CUNY Graduate Center in Theater and Performance. Um, the question is, you, and this is for Hui, you previously mentioned that the instruction for the spectators were pre-recorded and individually accessed by each spectator. My question, how do you see the conversation among spectators before and after the performance or experience sharing among them outside the performance itself? How does this contribute to their individual experience during the performance? Um, yeah, so I think I should be clarify one thing. Yes, the, the, the the voice or the the sound, the other this kind of series of other is pre-recorded, but it was released uh, manually 
so I said there are five coordinator hidden in the audience group. So when we reach a certain place, the coordinator in the group would kind of like release the order. So it's kind of like um uh we are we can influence the emission of the others so the way that responds to the others always only influence our different manners and mode of uh, participation so during the yeah that was a very good question so during the performance um there is a there are a certain moment that uh, the voice kind of want to separate the collective and there are a certain moment they want to reunion the collective there are definitely uh, kind of uh, the, the voices play with collectivity and the individualism. But after that performance, uh, I didn't contact uh, the spectator participant in that. So I, the one, the, the group, the people that in, in the performance that I participate with, but I kind of like do an interview with them, other, perf other remote version. I asked their experience. So yeah, I, I, I didn't get any feedback from the audience member from the performance that I participate with. Yes. Thank you. And again, we're, we're about to wrap up, but I just wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank the organizers of this conference um, and especially our three panelists right now, our, for our first panelist, Caro, Tim, and Hui. Thank you so much for participating today. Thank you to all of our viewers at home, everybody who's listening, everybody who's watching this. Um, it's such a difficult time right now and it's uh, so wonderful and heartwarming that people can come and come together and have this space to exchange ideas and to present their work. Um, thank you again and uh, continue to, um, to <laughs> continue to do really good work uh, if you can and also be safe and healthy and take care of yourselves um, and continue to tune into our conference today. Again, at um, hashtag networks, network 2020 at HowlRound. Um, thank you again. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you like... everyone. And our next panel will start in eight, in eight minutes.